The Mount Tom Range has been called the jewel of the Connecticut River Valley in western Massachusetts. Here, habitats vary from low elevation wetlands to mature upland forests to steep wooded talus slopes and cliffs. And while winter woods may appear bleak and lifeless at times, there's a lot that can be revealed. A red-tailed hawk is watching an unexpected little animal cross a frozen beaver pond. It moves in for a closer look, but this mole has made it safely across the open pond. Something in these woods has eaten needles off of low-hanging hemlock branches, chewed off the buds of mountain laurel, stripped some young bark, and even nipped off the buds of white pine. This all points to one animal, the white-tailed deer, and there are many of them at Mount Tom. Where they've bedded down, their body heat melts the snow, which later refreezes, leaving the curved impressions of their bodies, usually on higher ground, which provides a good lookout vantage point. If snow gets deep, it's important for deer to have the shelter of dense conifer stands. Beavers are active at Mount Tom, and they too need shelter from the elements and predators, and they find it underneath this snow-capped dome that they've constructed. An interesting set of tracks leads up the embankment from the pond. Drag marks in the center are a giveaway. Those are the marks of a tail being dragged. These were made by one of the beavers, and it came ashore scratching around for acorns. Like a small icebreaker, it plows channels through the thin ice with its snout. After spending many weeks in the darkness of its lodge and under the ice, it must feel nice to be out on the surface and in the sun. I get the sense that it's longing for some fresh, green, lush vegetation to munch on for a change. This large black birch was taken down by the beavers late last fall. The meager nourishment in the buds, twigs, and bark of its crown have helped to sustain the beavers over the winter. The fallen tree is hung up in other trees, so some of its crown is out of reach to the beavers. But about half of it is essentially a hanging brush pile. Tonight, this one adult beaver has taken on the task of cutting up and hauling back to the lodge as much of this brush pile as it can. This is not going to be easy, and while he's on land, the beaver is exposed to the dangers of predators. So it certainly helps to have chisel-sharp teeth that can cut through small branches in seconds. One by one, each piece is dragged to the water, which is a few yards away, and hauled all the way back to the lodge. The pile is dwindling. This one is still attached to the tree trunk and is going to have to be cut. One last little piece to clean up. Oh well, might as well eat this one. In less than two hours time, this one adult beaver has cut and hauled away 
the entire pile. Hmm, do I see a twig? Winter is getting old, but it still has some life left in it in the form of snow and freezing rain. I can think of no other animal that seems to truly enjoy winter snow, like the river otter. The presence of otters indicates clean, unpolluted water, a good sign for Mount Tom. Otters are aquatic creatures living in rivers, streams, ponds, and lakes. Their diet consists mainly of fish and crustaceans. Otters are usually wary creatures. They do cautiously come ashore at selected favorite places that they use as latrine sites. They seem to be particularly fond of rolling around in the snow or on the ground. I was puzzled by this little dance routine until I realized they do it when they're using the latrine site for its intended purpose. A fallen log across a stream can be a frequently used bridge. Raccoons routinely use these crossing sites. And so do bobcats. A young red squirrel is exploring one end of the bridge. Apparently, much to the displeasure of the resident adult. And the youngster is quickly invited out of the neighborhood. The melting snow exposes the maze of tunnels created by voles and mice. Mice are everywhere in the woods and hunted by virtually every predator including weasels. Another resident rodent at Mount Tom, the porcupine. In winter, they don't venture far from their den site. It's dining on this little hemlock twig that it probably snipped out of a tree previously. Ah, and a tasty frozen acorn. That's a treat. Its defensive weapon of choice, a tail full of quills that it can smack in the face of an attacker. After that meager snack, it's time to head back into the den. In this case, a hollow oak tree. It pauses to urinate before climbing up into the den. Porcupines are not tidy den keepers. Whether in a hollow tree or a hollow in the rocks, a porcupine den can be identified by the accumulation of scat and even an occasional quill, a blurred movement in the trees. It's the nightly activity of flying squirrels, and they don't sit still for a moment. A large flap of skin that stretches from ankle to wrist is used as a sort of parachute to glide from tree to tree. These attractive little animals are quite common, but they're seldom seen because they're almost exclusively nocturnal. Cold weather has put solid ice back on the beaver pond, although water is flowing below the dam. On these sunny late winter days, you can often find these pepper-like specks in depressions in the snow. They're springtails, or snow fleas. They're harmless, and sometimes you can find them by the thousands.
Winter is quickly flowing away with the melt water. On a southerly breeze over the range, here comes spring. It's the return of the turkey vultures. With the pounding heartbeat of streams all over the mountainside and the emergence of colorful skunk cabbage in the wetlands, there's a definite feeling of awakening in the air. These are the cool, damp days of early spring. This otter is heading upstream for a feast. Having punched several plunge holes through the thin ice, it now has a working platform and a dining table. With an apparently ravenous appetite, this otter spent hours repeatedly diving into the lake, pulling up fish. Telltale track patterns in the ice are a clue to the presence of otters, as are piles of their scat, which obviously contain remains of fish and other aquatic creatures. Another otter in the cattails? No, it's a muskrat heading out to feed. It probably has a burrow in the embankment. A lone barn swallow is picking insects off the ice. Set against the subdued earth tones of the spring forest floor, mosses, lichens, and fungi jump to life. The downy is the smallest of the woodpeckers to be found at Mount Tom. The quite similar hairy woodpecker is a little larger. You might be lucky enough to see a yellow-bellied sapsucker. The northern flicker is commonly seen. In the last several decades, the red-bellied woodpecker has become quite common here. And the large, pileated woodpecker seems to be most people's favorite. Sometimes emerging from underground hibernation when there's still snow on the surface, the common garter is the most abundant snake at Mount Tom. A snake's way of smelling the air is to stick its tongue out and sample it. It's March and there's some strange sounds emanating from the woods. It sounds like ducks are having a party. Wood frogs. They've been frozen solid in the leaf litter all winter. Now that they're thawed out, they have one thing in mind. They're moving by the hundreds to vernal ponds. Last fall, their bodies produced glycerol, which allowed their bodies to freeze solid without damage to their cells. All around the vernal pond, the forest floor is alive with hopping wood frogs, all with a single purpose, to get to the pond and find a mate. Only the males make this peculiar quacking sound and it's to attract a female. The males will rush any other frog they see, hoping it's a female. And often it's not.
This is the goal, to grasp a female in a hold known as amplexus, in which the male can fertilize the eggs of the female as she releases them. Often, several frenzied males will try to grasp the same female. It all looks pretty uncomfortable for the female, who at times seems like she'll be drowned or choked, but she survives it. The wood frogs must have vernal ponds to reproduce in because the ponds dry up each year, which keeps out fish that would prey on their eggs. After a week or two of this activity, the frogs will leave the pond and return to the forest floor, leaving behind masses of eggs, such as these. Spotted salamanders will also mate in the ponds and in other bodies of water, and leave behind similar egg masses. Another amphibian found in the pond is the red-spotted newt. Similar to the wood frog, the male grasps the female. He releases pheromones and fans them toward her with his tail to entice her. Their larval offspring will have gills, but eventually will leave the pond as a juvenile red eft. This will live on land for a number of years, and eventually will return to water as an adult. Having this terrestrial stage in its life allows populations to mix. The red-tailed hawk is still frequenting the wetlands. On the western side of the range, the arrival of spring is announced by the blooms of shadbush, or serviceberry, one of the earliest flowering trees, and by the male catkins of paper birch. In the cattails by the lake, red-winged blackbirds have already established their territories. A male proclaims this as his. This is one of potentially several of his female mates. He'll drive off any other males that threaten his territory. The red-tailed hawk that's been hunting the wetlands also has a mate and a nest high up in an oak tree. and at least one young in the nest. One of the adult beavers leaves the safety of his stream in search of food. Did it just become a food item? No, the following night it reappears, but it's so much more cautious now. It's not willing to venture very far from water's edge. It yanks out a clump of grass and gets back into the water.
and a hungry bobcat sits in the rain waiting for another opportunity. Another of New England's top predators, the Eastern Coyote, now being called by some the Koi Wolf. This is a highly adaptable opportunist, living virtually everywhere in New England now, and considering their numbers, they stay remarkably well hidden from us. They're believed to have originated about a century ago as a hybrid between the Eastern Wolf and the Western Coyote. They roam the entire Mount Tom range, but aren't often seen there. Colors are starting to brighten the woodlands now. The forest floor is perking up with yellow violets. Trout lily. In some wetlands, the marsh marigold. Purple trillium. And the state flower of Massachusetts, the trailing arbutus, or mayflower. Sometimes painted turtles just can't find enough basking spots. A hatchling painted turtle has emerged from its nest in the sand and it's making its way to water. It's one of the red-tailed hawk's favorite hunting grounds. The tiny hatchling is but a snack. Had it been as well camouflaged as this moth, it probably would have survived. A morning cloak butterfly that overwintered as an adult enjoys the spring sunshine. Leaf buds are popping and foliage is quickly developing. A pair of yellow rumped warblers have found some promising habitat around the beaver pond. A brown creeper methodically works its way up tree trunks looking for insects. Tree swallows will be spending a lot of time in the air also taking insects. Spice bush, a wetland shrub, is in flower now. Scratch its bark with your thumbnail for a spicy fragrance. Phoebes are skilled at taking insects out of the air over a pond. Something else is moving more slowly under the surface. A hefty snapping turtle. A beaver pond wouldn't be complete without a pair of wood ducks. In the early morning light, hooded merganser ducklings and their mother are making the rounds of the beaver pond. And a pair of Canada geese seem proud to parade their young ones around. Another female wood duck and her chicks are here too. A family of coyotes has been frequenting the forest around the beaver pond. In spring, queen bumblebees, the only ones to survive the winter, can be seen scooting along the forest floor looking for a new place to start a colony. Seemingly overnight, the forest turns green.
I almost stepped on this harmless little garter snake who tried hard to impress me. It's early morning and a bobcat is heading down to the beaver pond. It's been spending a lot of time here, so it probably does well. A Louisiana water thrush uses the beaver pond to hunt for insects and other invertebrates. As does a solitary sandpiper, which probes the shallow waters looking for a meal. The red-tailed hawk has caught a small rodent along one of the beaver dams. Something is moving quickly through the thickets. It's the common yellow-throat warbler. It spots a meal and wastes no time snatching it up. Springtime brings many species of birds to the Mount Tom range, like this female Blackburnian warbler. And this is one reason many of them are here. Food. Insect caterpillars are abundant and are just what's needed to feed young birds. In the oak and hickory treetops, indigo buntings find plenty of food. The fiery scarlet tanager. The great crested flycatcher. and the black and white warbler. All of these are just some of the treetop insect hunters that rely on the mature woodlands of the Mount Tom range. The parade of spring wildflowers continues with the blooming of bluets, rue anemone, wood anemone, more violets, lady slippers, and wild azalea, the pinkster flower. This soldier beetle has no idea he's being watched. A small beaver dam has created a pool that this white-tailed buck with velvet-covered antlers is enjoying. Having spent the nighttime hours foraging around the water, these deer are now moving to the relative safety of the uplands. Mallard ducklings have the run of the pond, while the mergansers are typically escorted by their mother. Royal ferns and cinnamon ferns grow along the margins of the wetlands, while carpets of hay-scented fern cover some areas of the forest. Moving higher in elevation, the striped maple and understory tree is now flowering. And the similar looking mountain maple also is flowering. The fringed polygola is a beautiful little wildflower. Ants carry its seeds away, thereby propagating the plant. Wild columbine grows on the upper reaches of the range. Flowering dogwood, a tree that's largely disappearing from our woodlands, still grows on some parts of the Mount Tom range. A 
A female flicker is busy excavating a nest cavity. These large woodpeckers specialize in eating ants and are often seen on the ground hunting for them. A female red-bellied woodpecker returns to the nest. She flies off and her mate who's tending the nest begins calling to her. Maybe he's looking for some relief. Finally, she returns to make sure everything is well. The talus slopes up near the ridge line create another habitat. Here, saxifrage grows out of the rock. A small geranium known as Herb Robert is found here. And under an umbrella of green foliage, wild sarsaparilla is flowering now. Delicate maidenhair spleenwort can be found. Large outcrops of ancient layered sandstone form part of the geology up near the ridge line. Many millions of years ago, hardened lava upwellings were tilted and thrust upward, forming the ridge line. Sedimentary sandstone layers were raised along with the hardened lava. The breakdown of these lava columns forms the talus slopes of trap rock we see today. These steep slopes of loose rock are rather treacherous places to explore, but there are interesting things to find here. Gnarly old black birch trees and some native red pines Along the backbone of the ridgeline can be found deerberry, maple leaf viburnum, sweet fern, wild roses, and numerous other flowering and fruiting plants. Here and there on the more gentle slopes of the mountain are rare, almost park-like, hickory hop hornbeam woodlands. These small forest areas are rare in Massachusetts and feature open, grassy understories. The tree species here are almost exclusively pignut and shagbark hickory and hop hornbeam trees. A variety of wildflowers can also be found here, including some rare species. The upper slopes are dry, primarily hardwood forests. Descending in elevation, we find a cooler, more shaded coniferous forest of hemlock and white pine. Fallen hemlock logs often sport the hemlock varnish mushroom. This is red squirrel habitat. A large part of their diet is made up of seeds taken from conifer cones. This female has reason to be on the alert. She has three young ones that are just learning the high wire act. It's late afternoon and some wild turkeys are making their way through the hemlock forest to an old beaver meadow, a dried up beaver pond.
The dense, weedy, brushy growth here gives them plenty of cover and protection as they comb through it looking for insects. And it's prime habitat for the Viri with its ethereal song. When beavers eventually abandon a pond and it drains, it creates a beautiful meadow habitat. This is a very attractive destination for many species of wildlife, such as the Baltimore Oriole. The stream that flows through this meadow, Bray Brook, flows into Bray Lake. The red-winged blackbirds that nest here are fearless in driving out other bird species that may prey on their nestlings. They'll drive away great blue herons. They'll harass crows. And even red-shouldered hawks. It's June, and Mountain Laurel is putting on quite a show. Its unopened flowers are reminiscent of cake frosting decorations. At the beaver pond, gray catbirds are calling. The stream exits the pond at the main beaver dam on its way to the Connecticut River, flowing through a veritable jungle of alder thickets, grass hummocks, sedges, and tangled vines. You wouldn't want to trip and fall on one of these alders freshly cut to a point by the beavers. A narrow, well-used game trail leads from this tangle into the shadows of the surrounding forest. If you feel like eyes are watching you here, it might just be the pattern on the back of this eastern-eyed click beetle. The black-billed cuckoo is more often heard than seen. Pileated woodpeckers are common in the mature forests of the Mount Tom range. Standing dead trees are very important to them for nesting sites. They're also important to the yellow-bellied sapsucker. Here, the male is removing wood chips from the nest cavity he's excavating. This gives the female a chance to inspect his work. Yep, looks good. And back to work he goes. A wood duck mother tenderly looks after one of her young. The pond is habitat for the striking ebony jewel wing damselfly. 
when mating, the male, shown here on the right, uses little clasping appendages at the tip of his tail to grip the female behind her head. She then curls her tail or abdomen up to his to be fertilized. In what looks like ballet over the water, she'll drop down to lay her eggs. Using an ovipositor at the tip of her abdomen, she saws a little hole in the plant tissue and inserts eggs. The pond is home to many species of dragonflies as well as damselflies. Dragonflies at rest hold their wings out to the sides, while damselflies at rest hold their wings above their bodies. Two meadowhawks are in what's called the mating wheel position. This is a male, common white tail dragonfly. When laying eggs, the female just dips her abdomen into the water and deposits eggs. Dragonflies often hunt from favorite perches where they sit and watch for mosquitoes or other airborne prey. Sometimes a collision will cause them to fall to the water. Not the place to be if there are fish around. Luckily this one was able to climb out of the water. And there is competition for territory. Dragonfly eggs hatch into larvae underwater, then transform into nymphs, which then climb out onto land to shed their skin and become adults. They now face another predator type that hunts from a perch. In a wooded swamp at mid-slope, there's a female fisher up in a large ash tree. This large member of the weasel family has made quite a comeback in Massachusetts in the last 50 years. She climbs into a tree cavity and there are remains of a gray squirrel on the ground. What's going on up there in that tree? Aha! She's kept three young ones up there overnight. An oven bird seems to be a little concerned about something.
High on the mountain, there's a shrub swamp surrounded by tall black gum trees. This one is over 100 years old. In early summer, fragrant white swamp azaleas brighten up the swamp. The pond is ringed by an almost impenetrable jungle of tall mountain laurel. On a summer evening, deer have quietly made their way through this tangle to a small, dried-up vernal pond. First a buck, and then a doe with her fawns. Game over, time for a snack. And a snack is just what this old male box turtle has had. He's been eating a mushroom. And he has many types on Mount Tom to choose from. But this plant is not a fungus. It's a parasitic plant called Indian Pipe. Having no green chlorophyll, it cannot photosynthesize and make its own food. It can be white or pink. A closely related plant that's coral red is called pine sap. Squaw root is another of the parasitic plants that draws nutrients from the roots of other plants. Young ravens are getting their first taste of high winds under the cliffs of Mount Tom. This one is nearly blown right off his perch. These young birds haven't yet learned how to find their own food, so they're waiting for their parents to bring food to them. Ravens are known for their antics and their high intelligence. With the reforestation of Massachusetts in the last century or so, raven numbers are on the increase. Below them, partridge berry is flowering now. And in the dogwoods nearby, in the rain, a robin is building a nest. She brings material in and uses one wing and her body to form the cup of the nest. A windstorm causes a leak in the beaver dam. While repairing the leak, the beaver is startled by this old raccoon, who has an itch that just needs to be scratched. There's someone else on the prowl tonight, who just found my camera. Done in by a steel locking cable.
Well, the beavers are back at work fixing that leak. Apparently this one wants to work alone. Introduction to dam repair. First, some sticks for reinforcement. Then, go to the bottom of the pond and bring up some mud. Next, with chin and feet, pack the mud into the leak. And don't be afraid to get your nose dirty. And if this character shows up, take a break. You can finish in the morning. Do a good job because everyone will see. Great blue herons hunt in the pond for fish and frogs. And voles. Now, voles go down easy, but that fish... The tiny spring peeper is a forest-dwelling frog that breeds in the wetlands around Mount Tom, as is the gray tree frog, which can vary its color from green to gray to match its surroundings. It's not often you find a wild honeybee hive. There is one 40 feet up in this pine tree. With scores of bees coming and going, there's bound to be some collisions. There's something odd swimming across Bray Lake. It's a harmless northern water snake. Harmless, that is, unless you're a small fish. Or perhaps a pickerel frog. It can be tough to be a snake in a world of human beings. Some people will kill any snake on sight. Maybe it's because they can move without legs. I only wish I could tolerate bugs getting in my eyes like this. Who doesn't enjoy seeing green frogs jump into the water? Rufous-sided towhees, male and female, nest on Mount Tom. As do rose-breasted grosbeaks, male and female. Another airborne resident is the parasitic thread-waisted wasp. It paralyzes its prey, brings it back to its lair, lays an egg on it, and the hatched larvae will eat the prey. These ants are not interested in killing their prey. They very much want to keep them alive. 
Scores of aphids are sucking juices out of the plant. They excrete a sugary liquid known as honeydew. The ants drink the honeydew and, in exchange, protect the aphids from predators. They even stroke the aphids with their antennae to entice them to release little bubbles of honeydew that they quickly lap up. Both the ants and the aphids benefit from this association. Throughout the forest, carpenter ants excavate galleries through the wet wood found inside trees. Sitting in a low crotch on this oak tree is a toad. And here comes an ant. Turkey vultures soaring over the range are a common sight. Today, using their keen sense of smell, they've zeroed in on some carrion. One is daring enough to drop to the ground while the others watch. They'll quickly clean up the remains of this dead red fox. Mount Tom is a famous nesting site for the peregrine falcon. Here, the adult female is bringing food to her four downy chicks. They'll be fed one at a time. The adult male will either be off hunting for more food or will be sitting protectively above. Two of the four chicks are now nearly ready to fly. They spend the long days waiting to be fed by the parents and keeping each other company. They practice revving up their flight muscles, and they'll soon be ready to go. It turns out there were three chicks in that red tail hawk nest, and they've already taken to the wing now. By late July or early August, cardinal flowers are blooming by the stream. These rely largely on nectar-sipping hummingbirds to pollinate them. As the hummingbird sips nectar, its forehead touches the pollen-bearing male flower, which is like a little brush. That male flower part later transforms to female, which picks up pollen from visiting hummingbirds. Later, each flower will release scores of tiny seeds that will be dispersed by the wind. An adult spicebush swallowtail may sip nectar from Joe Pie weed, but lays its eggs on spicebush or sassafras. Some of the other butterflies you might find on the range include the question mark, the red spotted purple, the red admiral, the eastern tiger swallowtail, or the Aphrodite, one of the fritillary butterflies. These have been torn and tattered by attacks from birds. Camouflaged as a bird dropping, this is the larva of a viceroy butterfly. Thanks to the surface tension of water, water striders can skate across the surface in search of insect prey. Summer has reached its peak. The meadow that was once a beaver pond is now a sea of bone set and goldenrod and jewelweed and other wild flowers.
Young turtle head flowers are so tightly closed that only bumblebees are strong enough to pry them open to reach the sweet nectar at the bottom. They must get their bodies all the way into the flower to reach the nectar. They often fail and move on to another turtle head flower. But when successful, they pick up pollen. Having only one pollinator may actually help the turtle head ensure that its pollen reaches another turtle head. A similar story can be told about the bottle gentian, another flower that only bumblebees can pry open. It's late summer on the Mount Tom range. The first mark of the coming fall has been made. A season's growth of duckweed makes a pond look like pea soup. The otter family is still active along the streams. One ventures a little farther into the woods. It seems to respond to chirps of family members back at the stream bank. Most vernal ponds, being temporary by nature, are dried up now. But the reservoir at the foot of Mount Tom has plenty of water, and migrating ospreys often stop by at this time of year to fish. Insect eggs of all kinds have hatched and the inhabitants moved on. Leaf skeletonizers have mostly finished their work for the season. Myriad forms of galls caused by insects abound in the plant world. And Mount Tom has plenty of interesting insects and arachnids and other invertebrates, such as this assassin bug, or a harvestman related to the spiders. And look at this peculiar twig. It's not a twig at all. It's a wonderfully camouflaged walking stick or stick bug, a harmless plant eater. This bizarre looking little creature is the larval form of the abbreviated button slug, a nondescript moth. Many species of birds and mammals benefit from the ripening fruit of flowering dogwood on the range. It's the end of summer and the end of a white-faced hornet colony. Only the new queens will survive the winter to start new colonies next spring. At the beaver pond, most of the breeding birds have finished their chores of raising young and have moved on but there's still work being done at the pond. Beavers must maintain the depth of their pond, and if it's too shallow so that it would freeze to the bottom in winter, they have to raise the dam and the water level. So, trees must come down. These will also provide food for a winter food cache. The beaver's increased activity on land is a natural draw for predators. This bear would pass up no opportunity for food, however, 
and just finished tearing up this old routed log, apparently looking for grubs. Its claw marks are evident on the wood. Coyotes and bobcats have continued to patrol the margins of the pond regularly. They scour the maze of game trails through the alder thickets around the pond. And their persistence paid off. Only the skull and hide remain of this beaver. An osprey is searching the waters of Bray Lake for a fish to help fuel its migration to Central or South America. After plucking one out of the water, it settles on a branch to chow down. When diving for fish, they're remarkably successful. Anywhere from one to three out of four attempts will bring them food. In 2008, one osprey reportedly flew from Martha's Vineyard to South America in 13 days. Their five to six foot wingspan serves them well. The last lazy days of summer on the mountain are fading into memory. But there is nothing like a New England autumn. Most of the plant world has finished its growing season, but which hazel is flowering now? Maintenance must be done on the beaver dam, and young beavers are learning how to help out. The dam serves as a good bridge for animals like the porcupine to get from one side of the stream to the other. Brushy and weedy stream sides are important not only for resident birds, but for small flocks migrating through. The wood ducklings are now grown and look like the adults. Mount Tom has long been a popular vantage point to watch the fall hawk migration. If you pick the right day and the right time, you may see thousands of hawks migrating through on their way south. The Mount Tom Oak Forest this year has produced a huge bumper crop of acorns. They literally rain down from above. Red oaks and chestnut oaks produced millions of these nuts. Some of the hickories had a good year, but not like the oaks. Acorns fell almost continuously, but every little breeze brought a shower. There's a theory about this bust and boom cycle of mast production from trees such as the oaks, beech nuts, and hickories. 
If seed production occurred at a fairly constant rate each year, then the populations of seed-eating animals would rise to more or less match that output, and few seeds would survive to become trees. By having a series of off years with low seed production, the trees actually control or regulate the populations of these animals. There simply won't be enough food to allow high reproduction rates. An unexpected bumper crop year allows more seed production than the animals can consume, and so there are seeds left over to create new trees. The vernal pond alive with frogs seven months ago is now dry. A plump blue jay probably got that way eating acorns. The puddle it's drinking out of seems to be boiling. It's all that remains of the water in the pond. What looked like boiling is dozens of tadpoles trying to survive. Gorgeous autumn days don't last forever, and creatures have to prepare for the coming winter. Snakes must find underground dens in which to hibernate. Spring peepers and wood frogs will hunker down in the leaf litter for the winter. Up on the mountainside, many small seeps and springs join forces to eventually become a cascade. This is Bray Brook as it begins its run down through the wooded Bray Valley. The woodlands here offer a pleasant walk through hardwood forests. One can find a mix of tall beech trees, ashes, sycamores, American Elm. And a few picturesque sugar maples. Such as this one. With work on their dams now complete, the beavers must turn their attention to maintaining the lodge. This means cutting and hauling more sticks dragging them up on top of the lodge, and then hauling more mud and packing it in. This will go on all night long into the early morning. And the next night, after a little mutual grooming, it's back to work again. Summon up your strength and heave that log. The last of the colorful autumn days are passing quickly. The colors are becoming more muted now. Some animals have moved from the lush, once green stream bottoms in the valley to the uplands to take advantage of the acorn crop. Now the cold night air settles into the valleys, bringing fog in the morning.
Although the days are gray now, there is still some color out there to enjoy. Unexpectedly, a yellow jacket is still on the move. Various fungi brighten the forest floor, and winter berries highlight the wetlands. Beavers have finished their work on the lodge, and they've established a winter food cache in the water next to it. This pile of branches reaches to the bottom of the pond and will be accessible to the beavers from under the ice, ensuring their survival all winter. The year is coming to a close. Countless new lives have started, and just as many have ended. At the junction of bobcat, squirrel, and coyote, life still goes on. Oh, it may seem like an empty, lifeless world out there, but remember, there's always someone home.